This video is an introduction to civil society and social movements. Traditionally, we think of, of civil society as a sphere of society that's separate from the private sphere, which is the private market, employers, uh, and so on, and the government sphere, which of course is state and sub-level, uh, sub-state level governments and, and the public sector. So civil society um, is in fact the third sector, which means that in, in many ways it's, it's negatively defined. It's, it's not uh, uh, the private economy, for-profit economy, it's not the state and, and its, its activities. And the, the common denominator here is that it's really actions and, and organizations of, of private citizens that take action for common goals and interests and values, really diverse, anything from, from sports, uh, bowling and, and hawk minor league, uh, and uh, hobbies, um, stamp collection associations, uh, to belief systems, your local churches and so on, uh, community groups, um, uh, it could be uh, safe houses and so on, self-help groups, uh, but also business associations where uh, local business owners go together for uh, to create a non-profit organization to represent them. Uh, it, these may be political and may be organized, this will vary a great deal, what the sector as a whole um, has in common and why it's significant in politics is that it increases trust in society. When people get together and talk about mutual or uh, mutual agreements or disagreements and manage to, to solve that in a peaceful manner, it increases trust in society. So uh, the general uh, conclusion in, in civil society scholarship is that uh, a vibrant civil society is really important for the, develop of a the development of a civic culture, a strong civil culture, and uh, trust between citizens in society, which is why um, the Tocqueville back in the, the early 1800s emphasized the vibrancy of civil society in the uh, new country of the United States of America. Uh, let's go over some of the actors in, in this sector. So first, uh, civil society actors. What are these? Uh, there are so many of them. Uh, we can talk about social movements and non-government organizations. There are slightly different uh, uh, takes here. I mean, a social movement is, in a sense, a non-government organization, or rather, a collection of non-organizations. So it's, it's kind of an umbrella for, for uh, the NGOs. What they have in common is that they are actors that represent the membership or represents interests of, of the membership in a non-profit manner. And they often engage with politics in different ways, partly because it's uh, beneficial for politicians and, and uh, civil servants to engage with uh, civil society groups in a particular policy area uh, because it's a way to gain information from constituents and communities uh, between elections. Uh, so it can often be beneficial to include civil society organizations in a policy process. Some people are worried about the damaging potential to the democratic process. The idea here is that to be involved in the political process is an issue of resources. Uh, the more money you have, the more time you have, the more ability you have as an organization to be engaged in the political process. But of course, uh, resources are not dis distributed equally between all stakeholders in society. So maybe some groups get more attention than others. Who are those groups and um, how should we deal with, we deal with such a problematic? That's a basic uh, set, set of basic uh, issues for uh, civil society actors in the study of, of how they're involved in the political process. Uh, when it comes to civil society in the global north, a very interesting factor in politics is really the social movements. And these are networks of organizations and unorganized people, unorganized in the sense that they didn't necessarily pay a membership fee, uh, who work together in, in loosely formed coalitions, but they you know, work for a common purpose. So they're all animated by the same idea. And uh, they can often go beyond the activities of interest groups. So if you think of interest groups as lobbyists or, or organizations that engage in a particular uh, arena, political arena, uh, social movements uh, will often go beyond those types of activities. But even if they engage in, in very public displays of protest against government, for example, uh, rallies or sit-ins and so on, they uh, 
might express a great deal of, of opposition to a government of the government of the day, uh, but they tend to not question the legitimacy of regimes. Uh, so you won't see too many of these social movements engaging in questioning the democratic system uh, as, a, as an ideal or actively pursue a radical constitutional change within the political system they're working in. So they tend to strengthen the civic culture uh, of a political community rather than uh, undermine it. Of course, here's the, the cleavage between um, the peaceful uh, segments of social movements and the small groups that might be trying to engage in advocacy on the same issue but use violent means to do so. Most uh, people who are engaged in the peaceful parts of social movements are, are really frustrated by those who use violence uh, to create attention uh, around a particular um, issue. Even though, uh, so it's often a case that the people who, who do engage in violence get more uh, attention than the peaceful activists would like them to because, of course, of, of uh, media logic in terms of uh, creating a dramatic story around um, uh, around a, a protest. Another uh, interesting dimension of this is the effects of post-materialism on political engagement. Uh, since the 60s, when politics tended to be more class-based, uh, there have been important changes around, uh, shall we say, the, the middle uh, of the, elec uh, the electoral uh, mainstream. We've seen uh, one example of this is the growing role of women in, in, in political life. But it really goes beyond just uh, gender cleavage. It, it has to do with, with the new type of middle class uh, rising with the no new social movements. So this is really closely tied to identity politics and the rise of post-materialist values. Uh, so you'll have the feminist movement, the queer movement, the civil rights movement, the peace movement, the green movement, all of these movements that really gained momentum during the late 60s and uh, are now very much part of the political dynamics in all uh, global North countries, uh, very much expressions of, of these post-materialist values. Now, NGOs, of course, uh, being the organized uh, bodies of civil society, they can be Greenpeace, they can be Doctors Without Borders. I even have an example here of the National Rifle Association, which is also a non-government organization, not for profit. And this tells you that, that uh, they can have quite different agendas. They also, this example also tells you how uh, Greenpeace, for instance, uh, which is both an NGO um, which is why it goes into this circle here, uh, but it's also part of the social, the environmentalist social movement. So it actually belongs in the social movement circle as well. So it tells you how an organization like Greenpeace is a formalized organization. It has a charter, it has members uh, who pay membership fees, but it's at the same time part of a larger uh, social movement that includes other organizations like the Sierra Club and so on, but also members who get active during particular flashpoints. And what uh, these civil societies society organizations do is, is, that, is that they really act as an intermediary between government and citizens. So this chart kind of, kind of shows this. You have, uh, this is a classic uh, Canadian style um, democratic chain, steering chain with the people, electing the legislature, electing the executive, uh, which uh, uh, controls the administration and, and produces policy. And, and the interest groups, I've placed them kind of here in the middle because, of course, they're mobilized from people just like a, a political party would. They don't seek political office. That's the difference from a political party. And they seek to influence the political agenda on all these different levels of government. And exactly where they'll spend their efforts here will depend very much on the political system. Uh, in the United States, you will find intense uh, work in Congress because th that can, can have a great deal of impact. In the United Kingdom, however, you'll see interest groups working more with the administration because uh, there is a greater success there. There is a greater chance there of influencing the agenda before deci decisions are being made. So how an interest group will strategize strategize to gain the greatest amount of influence on the political um, process will, will depend greatly on what political system there is. And this chart uh, shows how we can map different styles of trying to interact uh, with the government actors and, and the political process. So in, in uh, the scholarship then we tend to talk about this as policy communities and networks. And uh, this is a, an attempt to map influence. 
uh, you'll have groups of actors who have a direct or indirect uh, interest in an issue uh, and uh, members in the policy community often comes from non-government organizations or interest groups and they might very well have been brought in by government who want to have their input in the decision making uh, process. So uh, a policy community is really the trusted buddies around the government table in a sense. And there's a series of different networks that can appear depending on political system and political culture in a given country. Uh, so one is the, the pluralist style. Um, this is a case, this is a case where uh, power is widely dispersed between different actors. Get interest groups compete with each other for state favor. And a critique against this form of, of policy network is that, that the potential there is a potential for lobbyists to grow strong because you need a lot of resources as an interest group to gain attention because you're competing with all, all these other uh, interest groups who are also there to, to, to gain the attention of, of uh, government. So this is kind of what that structure could look like. Lots of different interest groups, they're all competing with each other and trying to gain favor from, from this guy, which is government. The classic case of, of and this type of network would be the United States, but also any type of, of uh, government, uh, any type of country coming out of the Anglo-Saxon tradition of governance, so uh, in, including Canada, given its, its British historical British roots, uh, the United Kingdom, of course, and so on, uh, they very often get labeled pluralist. Uh, the corporatist network is a different style power is much more centralized here and here government is is inviting a few trusted actors to cooperate with each other and the state in the formulation of policy and, and mo most typically this will be labor and business so they sit like in a triumvirate uh, and create a mutual understanding around particularly uh, uh, economic issues uh, very much class-based the problem here is of course for new actors to enter the field uh, so if you have the new social movements for instance they're not organized along, along class lines uh, so they're not uh, employee organizations or employer organizations uh, they will often be excluded from these networks that are already established and the doors are, are uh, much more difficult to open I put Japan here in the Keiretsu as one example Germany is another classic example of uh, corporatist networks uh, the Dirigist network is uh, a situation where the power is centralized to the state. Interest groups, they might get informed uh, of decisions if the government is so inclined, but they're definitely not consulted during the process. And they, they, um, the government does not see any reason to involve them uh, in, in um, pr getting information from them or having an influence on the agenda. Uh, so this is a case where power rests with the state and the interest groups are, are typically marginalized. They lack capacity to challenge the state. And the critique against this network is that there's too much power with the state, which makes it really difficult for bottom-up consultation and impulses from the citizens uh, to be heard between elections. The classic example of this would be France where government officials uh, consider themselves the experts on the issues and rarely, if ever, cons uh, consult with uh, NGOs. Uh, tied up with that is, of course, the discussions of iron triangles, like those we, we could see in Japan or, uh, or France, uh, which are networks of close cooperation between bureaucrats and politicians and, and uh, businesses, sometimes based, like in the case of France, on, on those prestigious enarch, the schools, uh, the grand de uh, where all of these actors have at one point been, and that has formed a certain type of group think. So that's an uh, so that's an overview of civil society and civil society scholarship, and uh, things to keep in mind as you uh, study issues of civil society and new social movements. Uh, I hope you found that useful.